Yes, Lord. Father, let us hear your, your word. Let us hear your voice. We desire to have your plan and your purpose. Father, give us your blueprint. Lord, not our own, but yours. That we'd hear your word and walk in your ways. Be obedient unto the paths that you lead us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you've got your Bibles, feel free to turn to this with me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. To Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times will come, for men shall be lovers of their selves, their own selves. Covetous or, or money lovers is another translation there, which is the, the abbreviation, the meaning of covetous. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, uh, disobedient, uh, unthankful and unholy without natural affection uh, lawbreakers false accusers uh, incontinent without self-control fierce despisers of those that are good traitors reckless high-minders high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power or the sovereignty, the lordship thereof. From such turn aside. Well, who wants to hang around with that mob anyway? <laughs> Here is a pretty graphic uh, warning. Uh, of the apostasy, of the, the falling away, of the perilous times in the last days. We are living right there right now. Who believes that? We are living right there. The Bible says that just as it was in the days of Adam and, and uh, sorry, in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days just prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read the account of what it was that God gave men over to their sensual, selfish, arrogant, ungodly, uh, demonic desires, unnatural desires, uh, to please themselves. Uh, and the world you know, has, a, has a saying, if it feels good, do it. Uh, regardless of the consequences of the outcome, uh, with no wisdom or understanding of how it ruins people's lives, including, first of all, your own. Amen? And so here we have a description of what it will be like in the last days. And as I travel around the world, uh, I see in many nations that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what uh, um, upbringing or it doesn't matter what nationality you are, uh, whether you're red, yellow, black or white, the heart of man is the same. I go into Africa and I see the heart of man is the same. You go to America, the heart of man's the same. Into India, Australia, the heart of man is the same. The needs and the requirements of man are the same. We are the same. Of the same heart, born into sin, and desperately need a saviour and need a Lord of whom we would uh, who would protect us and free us and cover us and lead us. Amen. Bless the Lord. That who knows the kingdom of God is exactly that. It's a kingdom. It's not a democracy. You know, we in this Western culture really have little understanding of what a kingdom is. You know, we're brought up saying freedom of to do whatever we want. You know, and sadly, the freedom is sort of twisted sort of freedom now where the people are not even, they're not even allowing you to spank your children or train a child in the way it should go. The, the rubbish stuff that's coming into the, the schools right now, which I was just reading the other day, that people are finally waking up to, that they're going in and under, what's it under? It's under an educational program of... Safe schools program, and they're teaching even even uh, like seven year olds and stuff. Imagine yourself if you're 16. It hasn't, it hasn't yeah. come in, but it's still in the it's still right. Well, this curriculum is is teaching a seven year old. Imagine if you, when you're 16 and you've got a friend who is of the same sex 
and feel free to do whatever you want. You know, unbelievable stuff. Absolutely unbelievable. And uh, they're ready to bring this in. And so we're going to stand up against this. Amen. But I say this because of the depravity of how the world has fallen and how what is good becomes bad and what is bad becomes good and acceptable. And uh, regardless of the, the consequences. And so here it says that in these last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves. And I won't read it all again. But here we are. And the end of it says that, that uh, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And interesting enough, it says then, having a form of godliness, the Greek word there is actual true, God, true righteousness. Having a form, a part, an understanding of God, but denying really his sovereignty and, and, and not obeying him. If you heard me preach before that, well, we know the Bible says that faith without works is dead or faith without action is dead. We, you've heard me say that, that faith without obedience is not faith at all. You cannot have faith without obedience. For that's what it always was. In the, in the Old Testament, God even declares to obey is better than sacrifice. What is this sacrifice? The sacrifice is simply going through the religious rituals and the motions of the law. And uh, some people want to just go through the action and they, they'll come to church, lift their hands and worship God. But are their lives living, the other six days, are their lives living into obedience, unto obedience and unto submission uh, and in love to please God. We know that Jesus summed up the commandments saying that thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. Amen. And love your neighbour also, is what he has commanded us. And uh, over the last few weeks I've shared uh, uh, a, a little bit around the Word of God. I think over the last couple of months I think I've shared three messages on the church. I love the church. I believe in the church. And uh, we, uh, some people sort of given up on the church. And they sort of pull out and drift, become drifters. Amen. Uh, but I believe in the church. I believe God is the creator of the church. The church is his uh, planting. The church is his idea. The church is given to us and we are told to be a part of the church which is purely and simply the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the body of Christ in this world and he is the head. Amen. He is the head. He is the leader. He is the master and the commander the head general that leads the army of God, the church of God. Uh, and uh, it says that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, in other words, the empowering is given unto, yes, under individuals, but it says it's given unto the church. The, given unto the church to declare unto this world and unto the principalities and the powers of darkness that he is Lord. And above and beyond him there is no other. He is God, there is no one else. And he is seated right now in heavenly places, far above all power, dominion, name, might, uh, understanding, argument, religion, training, whatever concepts people have, ideas. You, you know, it's crazy how you sit down talking to some people and the, the, the crazy mindset they have about God. And, uh, you know, in India, they've got like 350 million gods. And the Hindu faith, anything that, that moves or doesn't move is a god. You know, and so they worship these things. They uh, offer incense under these things. They, they bring sacrifice under these things. And so doing so, worship and sacrifice uh, and burn incense unto devils and idols and uh, create so much bondage and poverty and curses in their own lives. But when you come with the good news and you come with the full gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt love no other. Thou shalt worship no other God, have no other gods before thee. Thou shalt bow thy knee to no other gods or idols or graven images, but worship him alone. Yes. And when they, they hear, when their eyes are open, they see, when their ears are open, they hear, when their hearts are, are broken and they understand the gospel, oh, how they receive it with so much joy and excitement and uh, surrender their lives unto the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is given to, 
equip the saints for the work of the ministry. There's one thing that really, uh, I think, frustrates me. There's one thing that really grieves my heart, would be a good word, grieves my heart, and I see it all around the world, is how so many people despise and treat the church as insignificant. And the authority of the church and those, even the, the elders and the, and the leaders within the church. Now, I understand that, that we have, it, and we've all been there. <laughs> At least I have, I'm sure you have as well. You know, there's been times in our life we've brought up the church and we've been hurt, we've been embarrassed, we've been rejected, we've had the thumb over us, you know, or even our heads cut off when we've stood up to do something for God. <laughs> Amen. But that's not the church. That's a person misbehaving in the church. And we ought not judge the church by one dud pastor or someone that self-appointed apostle or prophet, whatever it may be. And let's not throw out, you know, the baby with the bathwater. You know, let's get rid of the filthy water, but let's keep the baby. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, and let's uh, believe in the church. Let me, read, let me read a few scriptures here. I have, it breaks my heart when I see that there's so many, uh, even pastors and those that declare themselves as leaders that have no godly character and no godly nature within them. And when put under pressure, the old man just comes out so easily. You know, that is why God tests us. That is God. That is why we go through tests and trials to refine us and to prove our faith. I think I've, I've, I've shared this illustration with you before, but let me share it again. If you were going under an operation and the last thing you remember hearing before they you know, knock you out and there's the doctor standing over you with the scalpel, you know, the knife, and, uh, and you, you ask him a question and you say, oh, doctor, have you done this before? And the doctor says, no, never. This is my very first time. <laughs> and I've never been to uh, I've never been to college. I've never been to doctor's university, and I don't hold a certificate. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> how how would that make you feel? Oh, thank you. No, and out you go. But you know what? The the purpose of education and of of all this uh, learning and and so forth is that you would attain the certificate that says unto you that you are trained that you are qualified that you are proven that you have been tested you know at the end of each year at school who you know we all went to school and then what happens at the end of the year you are tested and whether you learnt and whether you have uh, at a stage where you can move on to higher and greater things, that you were trusted with the knowledge that has been given unto you. You were proven and tested and tried to see whether you are capable uh, to hold an office or to hold a position or to operate as a doctor or whatever. If you fail, then you don't want a doctor who's failed his medical, you know, and practical to be operating on you. Amen? And uh, not that we need, I'm not talking here of, of getting certificates and qualifications. God anoints those he appoints. And there's many out there that have been appointed by man that God has not anointed and doing great damage in the church. And uh, Paul had the same problem. You know, Paul said there's some of those that have risen up from amongst us and gone out from amongst us and have, have maligned and has... Have, have stood against us and persecuted and stood against the work of God and done great damage unto the gospel and uh, has stood even against me. And uh, they came out, but they were, really weren't part of us. Otherwise, they would still be with us and remained with us in unity. You know, there's, there's a few blessings in the Bible, but there's one blessing that God absolutely commands. Yeah. Where there is unity... God decrees, God commands the blessing. That's a pretty powerful word. The church of the living God is God. You know, Peter. Uh, Jesus spoke to Peter. He says, upon this rock I will build my church. What rock? The revelation, the solid foundation that Jesus Christ is Lord and all-powerful. And he gives us the church, he gives the keys unto the church to bind and to loose. When he sent out the church out, he sent the disciples out, the 12, the 70, and so forth. He sent them out. He says, I give you authority. Go in my name. 
and bind and loose and heal and deliver and set free and preach the word of God. Declare the, the, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Amen. And uh, the whole gospel. We preach the love and the grace and the compassion and the kindness and the patience and the love of God. And we preach the wrath and the judgment and the seriousness of God for our God is a consuming fire. And what a fearful thing it is to fall into the hands of Almighty God. The Word of God declares, consider both His kindness and His severity. Amen? We are saved by grace. We are washed and cleansed, made holy, sanctified by the blood, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, who gave himself for the sin of the world, that whosoever should believeth in him, should believe in him, shall not perish. This word believe is not just what we just read here, having a form of godliness. And you've heard me say it many times, the devil himself believes. The demons themselves believe and they tremble and they, are, they shudder at the thought, terrified at the thought. It's not enough just to believe in God. This faith that we, we're told about is a complete life surrender. It is a laying down. It is a daily, as Jesus said, if you desire to be my disciple, there must be a daily death of yourself, of your own ambition, of your selfishness, your pride, uh, that which are the desires of, of, of success in the things of the world. If you seek your life, if you seek to make your life and to find your life and to be something in this life, then you shall surely lose it. But if you put it aside, if you lose your life, lay aside all those things you know that are not pleasing unto God and are self-pointing, <laughs> then you will find your life in Christ Jesus. Christ in me, my hope of glory. Paul declares there must be less of me and more of him. If Christ is going to live within me, then I must die that he might live. Nevertheless, I will live, yet not I, but Christ in me. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. These people had a form of godliness. And, um, you know, I, it, it, I, it really grieves my heart to see really the state of the church across the world today. That there, uh, Jesus said that you will know my church, you will know my people by their love. Yet there is backstabbing, there's crawling and clawing to the top, there's control, there's mismanagement and abuse of position, of power and of money. And that is not how it ought to be, sadly. But you know what? We could just throw our arms up in the air and give up and walk away. And Jesus said, that's not the thing to do. Do not forsake in the last days, even so much more, even as you see the time approaching, becoming closer of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not forsake the gathering together. Don't despise, don't walk aside away from the church, but, but gather together. Because you know what? There is a remnant. Amen? Yes, amen. In every, I believe in every city. In every town, in every place, God has those. Many are called, few are chosen. There is a remnant of faithful, holy, believing people in the faith. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I, I see... Sadly, uh, I've, I've seen some people come in uh, and out of this church and we have loved them, we have encouraged them, I've got beside them, many of you have as well, I know, have got beside them to encourage them and to, to bless them, to release them in ministry. But you know, sadly there comes a time, you know, we all hate the word submission and authority, <laughs> don't we? You know, and accountability there's three words we go oh, demonic that's all the devil hey it's not <laughs> you know but you know sadly we have come through hurt and um, and pain that has turned this around and the devil has taken hold of this and used it for his purpose to prevent us from experiencing the blessing 
and the God-given results of being accountable unto the Word of God and unto a local church and unto the, the leaders and the God-appointed authority. That doesn't mean they're better than anyone else. It's just the position they're placed in to, to serve, in fact, Word of God says that if you want to be a leader, then you've got to be the greatest servant. Jesus called his disciples aside and said, listen, if you want, I hear this murmur, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Who's going to be the best leader amongst you? Let me tell you, if you want to be the greatest leader, become the greatest servant. Serve. Love. Be faithful. And live your lives truthfully. Live your lives in such a way that, that those around you will not be able to point the finger and say you're hypocrite or you, you're whatever. You know? Live your lives in such a way that you will be an example unto the kingdom of God. Let me read to you from 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 to 3. And before I read that to you, let me say that I've seen good men and women of God that have missed the calling. And missed the purpose of God. When Jesus came, he said to the, those that were to be, that were appointed to be his very leaders and represent the gospel and represent God in, in the priests and the pastors, apostles, all this sort of stuff. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were, they were originally God's called chosen people to lead the people in the word of God. And they had become so self-righteous. They had become so of their own kingdom building and their own glory and success and self-righteousness. They became stuck up and arrogant and rude that they missed the visitation of God. Jesus said, oh, you have missed the visitation. You have missed the move of God. And in fact, they crucified him, didn't they? Crucified Jesus. And sadly, I have seen some men and women that uh, while everything's good and while they're being patted on the back and while they're enjoying the, the preaching of, of, uh, and the teaching of love and maturity and having a happy, glorious time in worship and in the presence of God and everything's going good, but when something in their life is risen and, and they're called aside and, and, and corrected and straightened out and occasionally rebuked, Immediately they just up and off. That is not the purpose of the church. And sadly, and I've been broken hearted at times. So I've poured myself into people and released them, encouraged them. And even as leaders in this church. Amen. And, uh, and, then, and then they've come up with something in which I've stepped in and looked at. And, and the first rebuke they're off. That is sad. That is sad. Not just for the church. Do they not realize that they are part of the church? That when a part of it's cut off, they're missed. Mm. And they don't realize that their purpose and their calling is in the local church to go out into the world and to work together for the sake. And, and look, this is a, what I'm speaking today. You know, most people don't talk about it, but I'm just being truthful and honest and I'm being practical because this happens in every church. You know, there's no point, you know, shoving it under the carpet and, and trying to be like an ostrich with a head in the sand to think it's not happening. Because it does happen. And we need to treat it. We need to speak about it. We need to correct it. We need to be truthful about it. I mean, because the Bible is. The huh. Bible is really open and honest about it. Paul Paul's often spoke and wrote the epistles to the church and says, For goodness sake, guys, stop your bickering. Stop your arguing. If it's not really a contentious, you know, if it's not really a doctrinal major thing, in other words, if it's not sin, then if it is sin, cut it off, get rid of it. For a little bit of leaven, left will spread through the whole loaf. And he told us clearly how to deal with sin in the church. And uh, there's been times I've dealt with sin in the church and lost half the church. And uh, others have remained, but there's been a, you know, there's been a disrespect and there's been a, you know, a... a uh, Anger or whatever because I've kicked someone out of the church because they're professing to be a Christian but they're living in sin. And after years of warning them and spending untold nights with them, praying with them and teaching them and warning them, they still continue to lie and deceive and, and so forth. The Bible says just hand them over to the devil, kick them out. Nothing to do with them. Don't even, the Bible says clearly if there's a brother and sister, if there's someone amongst you that is declaring themselves to be a Christian, and they're living in sexual immorality. Or they're living in, listen, in greed. We don't often speak about that one, do we? 
it comes right next to sexual immorality, you know. And if they're an alcoholic, uh, and it lists all this stuff, he says, then, then, then do not entertain this. Challenge them. Listen, if we were allowed, and, and sadly I see so many big churches that are allowing many people to fill their seats, declaring themselves to be Christians, and uh, because they want numbers and tithes and offerings and everything else, they're allowing them to be called a Christian and so living in such a deception. They're sitting in their seat knowing that they're living in immorality and they know the pastor knows, but he's not prepared to challenge them. So they sit there thinking, oh, it's okay. Other people see that the pastor's allowing this person to sit and they think, well, that's okay, he's, he's allowing him to, so I'll just go off and dabble in a bit of sin and, and you know, he's going to still love me. You know, the preaching from the pulpit is all about, oh, it's okay, let's just be compassionate, let's just be understanding, you know, what's the word? Tolerant. Tolerant is the word, that's the big, big word of the day. Let's just be tolerant, we're just called to be tolerant. Listen, when it comes to sin, we're not called to be tolerant. Amen. We're called to expose it because Jesus said when the light comes into the darkness, the darkness flees. But what else happens? When light comes into the darkness, it exposes sin. And all of a sudden it's clearly seen, those people that have been living in darkness, the sin that they're living in. And many people don't like to come into the light because of fear of the sin that's in their, in their lives. But Jesus said... That we must come, we must turn from our sin. He came preaching a clear message, gave his disciples a clear message to preach. Go and preach repentance, turn from your sin and humble yourself. The father that loves his children disciplines them. Amen. The Bible also says if you're a child of God and you do not, and you despise and reject the discipline of God, then you are an illegitimate child. Amen. That is, the Bible's pretty tough, you know. The Bible's very clear. But you know why? Because the Bible, if it allowed sin to remain in our lives, and if it overlooked the sin in our life, people say it's okay because grace just covers our sin. What a lot of rubbish. Grace does not cover our sin. The blood of Jesus covers our sin. And doesn't cover it. The Old Testament, it tried to cover it. The New Testament, it totally obliterates it and destroys it. Amen. Listen, did Jesus die that we may continue to sin without feeling guilty? Hello? Did Jesus die on the cross that we may just continue to sin without feeling guilty? No, God forbid. This devil doctrine that's out there. You know, this super hyper grace and love of God. Oh, it's okay. God loves you anyway. Rubbish. <laughs> oh, but he loves the, loves the sinner, hates the sin. Well, let's not just get confused about this. Is he going to send the sin to hell or is he going to send the sinner to hell? Hello. Amen. 1 Peter 5 verse 1 to 3 says, Therefore I strongly urge the elders among you, pastors, spiritual leaders of the church, as fellow elder and as an eyewitness called to testify of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd and guide and protect the flock of God among you. Notice he says among you. One among. A leader is not above. You know, in the sense that God loves them any more or they're any more special, anything like he is among the people. But there are leaders that are given. And the purpose of the, the leaders and the, the part, the elders, if you want to be biblical, are their elders. You know, the elders of the church are given to shepherd, to guide, protect, and lead the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. Not motivated by shameful gain, <laughs> by profit. Some people, it's amazing overseas. Some pastors just want to become pastors so they can have an income. I'm sure that doesn't happen in Australia. You know, um, you know, compel. Uh, and then when they're pastors, they're the pastor. I don't have to work. I've just been sadly talking to a, a pastor that I've worked with, done crusades with, set up rescue centres with, an orphanage and everything. Spoke to him recently, and he says, "I'm a pastor. I don't have to work." <laughs> And I'm saying, God, I want to raise a thousand dollars to put a, a, a workable business with pigs and chickens that will supply food for the children or for the girls, whatever, and uh, and and then it will give extra to sell, and so you can become self-supporting, 
and grow the ministry and rescue more. Oh, I'm not going to set up a business. I'm called just to preach the gospel. Listen, if it was good enough for Paul the Apostle to preach and to work. Let me tell you something. I've never... Actually, I lie. There was three months when I was on a pastoral staff in a church many years ago. They gave me a wage. Other than that, three months of my life, I have never pulled a wage and still don't pull any wage from this church or any church. Every dollar that comes in here goes to souls. Every dollar that comes in here goes to souls and to taking the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've always supported myself and our family. Julie and I support our family by working with our hands. Amen. As you know, I'm away nearly every month overseas and have been for nearly six years now. When I'm back, I work hard. Amen. To bring in food so that I'm not a burden. Listen, and Paul says that clearly. Paul says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Yeah. All you lazy out there, get off your bats, get off your backsides, get out there and work. And the purpose of work is not just to provide for yourselves. The purpose of working is to provide for others, those that are in need, and to sow into your heavenly bank account, to put into the kingdom of God. The Bible says very clearly that in the last days, there are those that are living amongst you that are living in indulgence, and in wealth and in security and storing up wealth for the, in the last days. And, and, and God calls them pitiful and gluttons and they're fattening themselves like the calf for the day of slaughter. Wow. Because we're sitting on this stuff and we make this stuff our security. Listen, who ought to be your security? God. Jesus. Some people look to investments, to shares, to property, to possession. No. No wonder he strips it all away. When we make these things our God. You know, like Snoopy, like Linus with his blanket. Carries around his security blanket. Carries around him. It's time, and this will, I believe, get stripped away. And there's nothing less. Everything's going to be tested. Everything's going to go on through the fire and be burned. And listen, if it's not done if it's not for the kingdom of God and if it doesn't give glory to God and bring souls and make disciples it's all going to burn and it's going to pass away some of us will be left with nothing and sadly even that which is left will be taken from us but that which is done for the kingdom of God shall last shall remain amen Bless the Lord. So here's, here's, here's uh, Peter speaking to the pastors and they're saying, lead them, not out of compulsion, not out of uh, greed uh, for, for wages, not out of power for position and for recognition, but shepherd the flock, guide them, protect them, love them. Um, do it voluntarily uh, in, in the sense that we're willing it's the desire of our heart, according to the will of God, um, with the wholehearted enthusiasm, not lording it over those assigned to your care. Do not be arrogant, do not be overbearing, but be examples of Christian living to the flock. Set a pattern of integrity for your congregation. Don't you love that? Who likes that? Yep. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Hebrews 3. Let me whisk for a few. We've only got five or ten minutes maximum left here. Let me for a few scriptures here. This is the word of God, not mine. Amen. If we've got a problem with it, argue with God. Hebrews 13 verse 17 says, Obey your spiritual leaders and submit to them. We hate that word, don't we? Uh, submit to them. Recognize their authority over you, for they are keeping watch over your souls and continually guarding your spiritual welfare as those who will give an account of their stewardship of you. Let them do this with joy and not with grief and groaning, for this would not be benefit to anyone. Amen. That's a pretty powerful scripture, you know. Sadly, I've sat down, as I've shared before, I've sat down with those that we've loved and cared and released. And, and after even two or three years, they get their knickers in a knot over some stupid thing. And I sit down and I say, guys, come on, grow up. Oh, don't tell me to grow up. And off they go. Where's this submission? Where's the accountability? If we're going to be 
in this church. And let me say, you know, if, if we're not going to have respect for the, the, the leaders, the elders in a church, why are we here? Go out and find another church where you can respect the pastors. If there's no respect and obedience and submission to the authority that God has planted, because we're here, you know, one thing you'll find with me, I speak the truth. Sometimes the truth hard to hear, you know, but I speak it, you know, because if I see there's areas that are going to become a problem in your life, I will confront it. I will bring it up and challenge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to get right. Amen. To put it right. Because if not, it will grow and it will fester and it will be like leaven amongst the loaf that will just spread right through. And um, but we need to do it with patience. We need to do it, but there's times the Bible says it's given. We need to be rebuke, and we need to correct. And uh, and uh, sadly, you know, those who have a true heart of God, Paul says, guys, get with it. He writes to the church, says, will you get with it? Put aside your indifferences. Put aside the perhaps the ways things have done that you wouldn't have done it. But listen, the results are the same. You've heard me say that before. We've got different personalities. We've got different temperaments. We've got different giftings. We've got different... There's many ways that we can do things, you know? And if someone does it the way you don't like or wouldn't do it, well, pull your head in. It doesn't matter, you know? If you're not out there doing it, don't criticize someone else that's given it a go. Amen? Amen. Amen. If I see you out there doing it, having it a go, and and uh, and uh, and it doesn't work, well, so what? You have it a go. Amen? But if you're sitting there doing nothing and criticizing someone that's doing something, then I won't be happy. Not happy, Jan. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> because you know what? It is my responsibility and other elders... That are appointed in this church. It is our responsibility to watch over you and to recognize if you're starting to go off track a little bit and to come and sort of grab you and pull you back on there, you know? And uh, depending on the seriousness of it is, is how harshly and seriously you'll be spoken to, amen? But if you are truly have the heart of God and if you truly believe in the church and the purpose of the local church and your leaders that uh, they are godly amongst you, then listen to them and obey them because they're just bringing the word of God. Now, if they're living a hypocrite and living double lives, then get out and find a church where they've got leaders that are godly or challenge them. You know what? People say, oh, I can't challenge the anointed. Don't touch them. What a lot of rubbish. The Bible says we are submitted one to another as unto Christ. I am accountable to you just as much as you are accountable to me. And uh, Ray and Pascal are accountable as elders in this church to you as much as you are accountable to them. And if any of us are behaving in such a way that is not God-honoring, or if any of us are, are into something that you know is, is, is wrong, then approach them and say, Hey, listen, what are you doing? This is wrong. What do you think you're doing? <laughs> Come on, this is wrong. Stop it. If they don't listen, take another person. Say it again. If they don't listen, then bring it to the leaders of the church. If they, and if they approach by the leader, if they don't, then, then we'll kick them out. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know what? I have, um, I have felt just a little bit of the heart of the Father, who is a shepherd, that when a sheep has gone astray, was wandered off, even that has, has been kicked out, you know, handed over for a time. Uh, but there came a time where Paul said even the sexually immoral that was, was handed over and booted out of the church, uh, who he rebuked the church for tolerating, right? And after a time he said, okay, enough's enough. Love them. Bring them up. Love them. And if there's repentance and sorrowfulness, bring them back in. And love them and care for them and forgive them. Amen? And, uh, you know, I felt a little bit of that. And folk that have left, I've kept in contact over time. And I text them and say, we love you. The door is open when you're prepared to be sorry for your sin. Amen? And get it, get it right. Anytime you're ready to get it right, I'm here. I will cry with you. I will laugh with you. Amen? Praise the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says this. All scripture is God-breathed. 
given by divine inspiration. It is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately. Behaving honourably with personal integrity and moral courage so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. This is why there needs to be a high standard in the church. This is why sin is not tolerated. This is why selfishness is not tolerated. This is why those who just all want to argue about everything. Paul says that some of you that just bring friction all the time. All I want to do is bat, argue, argue, argue about this stupid stuff. He says, enough of this. It's rubbish. Actually, he says, don't have anything to do with them. Kick them out. You know, bring a disunity. Amen? And uh, but let's get the word of God clear. Let's get it in our hearts. 2 Corinthians 7. Therefore, since we have these great and wonderful promises... Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, completing holiness, living a consecrated life, a life set apart for God's purpose in the fear of God. But even though I did grieve with you, gr grieve after my letter. This is Paul speaking, following up after a letter he gave to the church who had tolerated and allowed sexual immorality in the church. And he wrote a, a pretty tough letter. And he followed it up. Listen to this. I do not, even though I regret it, speaking so harshly, I do not regret it now, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter hurts you, but only that for a little while. Yet I was glad now, not because you were hurt and made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance and you turned back to God. For you felt a grief such as God meant you to feel, so that you might not suffer loss in anything on our account. For godly sorrow that is in accord with the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But worldly sorrow, the hopeless sorrow of those who do not believe, produces death. For you cannot look back and see what an earnest, so for you can look back and see what earnestness, what authentic truth, real concern this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourself against charges that you tolerate sin. What indignation of sin. What fear of offending God. And what longing for righteousness and justice. What passion to do what is right. What readiness to punish those who sin and those who tolerate sin. At every point, you have proved yourself to be innocent in the matter. So even though I wrote to you as I did, I was not, it was not for the sake of the offender, nor for the sake of the one offended, but in order to make evident to you before God how earnestly you do care for us and your willingness to accept our authority. Wow. See that? Paul went in strong rebuking sin. And notice he rebuked those that tolerated sin. Let me say, if we're going to tolerate sin, and some of us have, you know, we've had, you know, had times when we've, uh, uh, you know, I've kicked someone out of this church because of, of sin and wrongness, and some people in this church have gone after them, put their hand around, and said, oh, it's okay, don't worry about the past. So we just love you, we just love you. What are you doing? Number one, you have no respect for the authority of the church and for the word of God that has told us to do this. And when you go after someone that is living in sin and won't repeat and say everything's okay, you are partaking in their sin and you are making them feel comfortable in their sin and the whole idea for this is to kick them out is to hand them over to Satan that they might learn a hard lesson so that they will not go to hell but if we allow sin to remain and remain people deceived in the church and in fellowship thinking that they can continue in sin but still be accepted as a beloved and still be accepted in church and still be accepted as a Christian, then we de they deceive themselves and we are partaking in their deception by not standing up and affirming the word of God and affirming the decision. Do you think I love kicking people out of this church? <laughs> No, I hate it. Of course I don't. Right? But, you know, occasionally it may happen. And, and to, to go and contradict that which then is only followed by the Word of God, that which the Word of God tells us to do, is wrong. Amen? I'm just speaking it as it is. Amen? Is that okay? Okay, on closing. 
quite a lot of scriptures here that I haven't got time to go through. Next week. Yeah, say that and then next week there's another word. Amen. Acts 20, verse 27, 35 says this, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose and the plan of God. Take care. Be on guard for yourself, for the whole flock over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers, to shepherd, tend, feed, guide the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. I know that after I am gone, false teachers like ferocious wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Even from among you, your own selves, men will all rise, speaking perverse and distorted things, to draw away the disciples after themselves as their followers. Therefore be continually alert. Remember that for three years, night and day, I did not stop admonishing you, advising each one of you with tears. And, how, and now I commend you to God, placing you in his protective loving care. And I commend you to the word of his grace and the counsel and the promises of his unmerited favour. His grace is able to build you up and give you the rightful inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That is among those who are set apart for God's purpose, all believers. I had no desire for anyone's silver or gold or expensive clothes. You know personally these hands ministered to my own needs, working in manual labour and to those of the people who were with me. In everything I showed you by example, that by working hard in this way, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord, that he himself said it is more blessed and brings greater joy to give than to receive. Hallelujah. There's the heart of Paul. There's a heart that just desires to bless and to pastor and to speak the truth and to love and to care. Listen, a pastor's heart, a shepherd's heart is to care for people. And when he sees them heading a direction in their life that's going to cause heartache and sorrow, that may bring them to become shipwrecked, it is the pastor's heart to go and to bring truth and to shine the light and to say, this is not good, let's get back on track. You know, because when you get off track, you step out of the perfect will of God. And you step into your own will. And you create your own paths. And you think they're your own, but they're the devil's. And, amen? And, uh, and, uh, and you miss the calling of God. You know, I've sat down with some and said, guys, you're going to miss the calling. Don't you tell me I'm going to miss the calling. I said, I'm telling you. <laughs> you are going to miss the calling of God if you continue to behave this way. Bitterness will rise up in your heart and will lead you astray. Amen. There's much more to talk, but let's all stand to our feet. Hallelujah. I know that was a pretty that was a pretty heavy word this morning, I know. But you know what? It's part of the church. It's part of practical day to day. And uh, and it's it, it's the truth and it's the word of God. Amen. Amen. So listen, let me encourage each person here. When you see someone struggling, get beside them, put your arm around them, love them, support them, encourage them. If you see someone just beginning to get off track, put your arm around them, love them, correct them, show them the word of God, do it humbly. And uh, if there's no response, then come in more boldly. Amen. Amen. And use the word of God as a sword to pierce our hearts. The word of, it says that sword, the word of God is a sword that pierces our hearts. You know what it does? It divides. It divides between truth and a lie. Yeah. It divides between what is of the soul and what is of the spirit. Yeah. That's why I love just reading the word, yes, preaching the word of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. My wife's going like this. That means it's time to finish. <laughs> Let's finish. You know? Praise the Lord. Lift your hands to heaven. Father, we thank you for this time today that we have gathered together initially just in worship and in praise and in adoration. We thank you for the testimonies we've heard today. We thank you for the word that was brought today, the, uh, the, um, the word and the spirit that was brought today, the gift. And Lord, we thank you for your word that has been read and taught and spoken today. Let it bring edification. Let it bring correction. Let it bring encouragement. Let it challenge us. 
Let it encourage us and bring us unto maturity under the full stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that we are your body. We are your church. We are knitted together, woven together. Lord, we are members of one body that uh, build each other up and nourish each other, encourage one another. Lord, that we might uh, be a pure, spotless bride, ready, waiting for your return. <coughs> Active, obedient, full of action and of faith to declare your gospel, to make disciples in the name of Jesus. And then, Father, bless us as we go our ways this week. Lord, we, we choose. Lord, help us to discern and to be wise. Uh, Lord God, and help us. You said your, your sheep know the shepherd's voice. Let us hear your voice and follow. Let us be discerning and wise in what we do and where we go, what we say and how we behave ourselves, that we would bring glory unto the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the sweet presence and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide within us. We choose to keep ourselves in the love of God. As Jude declares, keep yourself in the love of God. Hallelujah. By choosing that which is right and to obey your word, then we can be partakers of your blessing, of your promises, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.